Well, welcome everybody to our February meeting. Um, you notice we're on Monday night. Um, we are experimenting with seeing what happens if we go to nights other than Saturday. There was some chatter about Saturday being a bad time, so we just sort of randomly decided to try Monday. So let us know what you think, um, and we'll go from there. Um, the um, I want to thank the New Jersey Antique Radio Club for sponsoring this meeting and providing the Zoom feed. We always appreciate that. And I'll let Dave say a few words about etiquette on the, uh, on the meeting. Oh, well, just the usual. Um, keep your microphone muted if you, uh, if you can. And um, if you can't, please refrain from uh, breaking dishes or arguing with your spouse or falling asleep and snoring. And yes, all those things have happened. So uh, just try to observe some Zoom etiquette and uh, we should be good. All right. Okay. Um, let me start with a museum report. Um, first of all, we just passed 150 members, um, which is way above what we've had in the past. Um, a lot of new members, people that, um, I've not been a member in the past. Um, at the convention, we typically get a bunch more because you get a discount on your registration if you're a member. Um, and that moves, brings me to the next topic and that is the convention. We are having one. Um, it's May um, um, 6th, 7th and 8th. Um, Format is going to be pretty much the same as the past, though we're still playing with it. The only um, significant difference is we're going to go with only a silent auction this time um, because um, we're not sure we're going to have the volunteers to run a live auction. So it's going to be a silent auction. Um, you can register for the convention now um, if you. Um, uh, look at the comments um, section here. You'll, I have posted the link to museum registration. Um, and we'd love to have you register as soon as possible because the more we know, the earlier, the better in terms of setting our, letting our caterers know and so, and, and so forth. I have no idea how many people are gonna show up this year. Um, on the one hand, there is um, um, a pent up demand for a convention. Um, and that will drive people there. On the other hand, I think people are still going to be skeptical, depending upon what COVID is like, uh, to travel. Um, so we'll see. Um, I'll report next next couple of months on, on, on how we're doing. I'm really looking forward to it. It's all falling together. Um, Blake Hinkle, which rec who recently joined the board, has um, volunteered to be our volunteer coordinator. Um, it would be as we've been reaching out to people for various, one of them. various positions. Um, in an earlier picture, they, they put it on the top of the van, and then the receiving dish was on the tower of a uh, television transmitter. And they, of course, had to be oriented within about um, a couple of degrees, or maybe even more closer than that, for the thing to work right. Um, What's going on? In the middle of the winter, the guy that had to climb the tower uh, in Newark um, and, and orient the thing, another, another miserable experience. What? Okay, let's move Dave, in. do you have any idea what's going on? This is a part of a YouTube go clip. Here. One of the cameras, an RCA um, TK30, I think, um, and they put their, the fancy wooden, um, uh, give me a second. A, a YouTube thing is playing an old video uh, along with the, uh, the recording that we're making. Give me a second to see what I can figure out what's going on there. Using it about 1970, uh, WGSF donated it to the Ohio Historical Society. Um, and it was like, any, lots of, or more, I imagine all state-run museums, they've got a big warehouse full of stuff that never sees the light of day. And somebody tipped me off that it was there. So I went down and talked to them and said, um, would you consider 
letting us use it because it'll be seen by people. And they went through their bureaucratic, pro bureaucratic process that took quite a while. And then they finally, um, finally agreed that they would give it to us on permanent loan. Recently, they've contacted us about, um, about uh, giving it to us. But in any case, it's here for, it's here for good. Um, we had a, a um, flatbed truck pick it up and uh, at, at the uh, Historical Society in downtown Columbus and bring it over here. And people ask this frequently, how do we get it in here? Well, um, I don't know if you could see on the wall there, there's, there are lines up near the ceiling of the top. That's a removable panel. <clears throat> so we took that out, uh, maneuvered the, um, uh, the van in and then put the paneling back up. And here is the air conditioner uh, that was added after, after it got here. Um, and I'll show you some of the, there's the power cable that they used. You can see the circuit breaker box. And somewhere in there, there's a um, uh, plug that fits a dryer outlet. Okay, I actually had to unplug the computer. <laughs> oven outlets as well. No oven wonder we couldn't see this is, this, that would give so, the, uh, so second time tonight we had a haunted uh, a haunted YouTube video come in. All right, sorry about that. I have no <laughs> idea what happened. We'll see. Um, all, all right. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> Quite a bit, I would imagine. Um, you know, it's a, I would imagine it's, um, I think it's the 30 amp. No, you know, no. <laughs> I, I, I unplugged the damn computer. Uh, this the, is interesting. Um, very act up here on the wall for adjusting the. Um, uh, it's alive. It's alive. It's alive. From, from their source. Here's the driver's seat. Dave, it's it seems to be coming out of it's only a dream. Yeah, we're not seeing anything. Here is the um, Dave. That can be from anybody's computer that's got a second uh, window uh, open in the background. All the original it, a dream that might kill it. The clock. I don't. Let think me uh, let me look to see whose microphone's open. Stuff that came from uh, uh, from RCA. Um, you had an audio guy, okay. and a camera guy, and then a director. Um, who sat in the middle. Who... Okay, looks like it was somebody else. <laughs> yeah, Steve, who are you there? Who your dream was, Dave. Yeah, okay. It's funny, that happened on, on the computer that I'm using to host the meeting earlier tonight, I had Chuck Azar's voice pop up, and it scared the hell out of me. Um, <laughs> So, uh, um, okay, good. Well, it's, uh, it's nice to know we're not crazy. All right, here we go. Steve, right. take it. Okay. All right. Anyway, so back to the convention. Um, we are going to be looking for volunteers um, for various things. Um, the, um, the first thing that um, we've announced is that we're going to have a, um, a workshop or a work day, I should say, on Friday, starting Friday morning, the weekend of the convention. Um, over the past two years, um, a number of the display sets that we turn on for people to see have stopped working. And since I haven't been in town, um, I haven't been able to uh, get them going again. So we've asked for volunteers to show up on um, Friday morning um, if you have technical skills to help us um, um, to help us with uh, getting some of these sets running, they should be fairly simple because they they've all been restored. Um, and um, we have a number of black and white sets, post-war and pre-war, and a few color sets that we want to get them going. Um, so um, so register if you plan on coming. The sooner the better. Uh, we'd love to um, love to see you. Now the um, 
the other thing that's happen happening simultaneously is the um, our sweepstakes this year. And um, this year, the prize is a um, pre-war TRK-12. Larry, at 120, TRK-120, I should say. Hey, Larry, can, you, um, can we put Larry on and let him go back and point the camera at it? I can try, but remember, I just unplugged the computer. <laughs> So let's see what happens here. Larry is Samsung something? Yep. yep. So there you go. And Well, while we're waiting for, there we go, there he is. Um, and here it is, it um, was donated to us this year. It's in pretty decent shape. It needs, you know, cosmetic work on the cabinet. It is, um, it works. It has a good, strong CRT in it. And it actually, the set actually works. It's not, it's got some minor glitches. The sink isn't ter terribly stable. Um, but um, if you look on our um, the sweepstakes page, you can see their screenshots. Uh, uh, so this is your chance to win a um, um, a pre-war set in working condition, which is uh, very, very, very um, hard to find nowadays. Again, I posted the sweepstakes. Well, I posted. Uh, I mentioned that I posted on the note in, on the chat section that. Um, um, there's a link to the sweep states on our homepage, earlytelevision.org. So uh, buy some tickets, you support the museum, and you might um, and you might win. The drawing will be at the um, uh, at the convention. Um, any questions about the convention or the sweepstakes? Well, then let's move on to our uh, the, the, the units where we're going to be looking at today. Larry, why don't you go back into the uh, where the uh, pay TV stuff is. We're going to show you a couple of um, early pay television uh, converters. Um, in the starting, you know, as far back as the 40s, um, the um, there were probably dozens of experiments with, uh, with pay television. Um, two of them um, we have the converters for. Um, one is the Zenith phone vision system. Um, and um, Zenith started in the 40s in, in, a, in a Chicago suburb using a TV station they owned there. And um, the video was transmitted without um, without sync. And so if you tuned to the TV station, you got a sync, a picture that wouldn't hold still. Um, if you wanted to buy a movie, which is what they offered on the sync, on the, on the, on the service, you had to call their switchboard and they would be patched, you'd be patched in to, um, uh, to the service. And what happened when they did that is they transmitted the sync over the phone line to your set and through the converter box, it was mixed with the video. And that's how you got your picture. Now their, their experiment was with 300 homes. Um, it wasn't very successful. Um, they didn't get the buy rate that they, uh, that they, that they hoped for. The, the experiment continued. That was in, the, in 1947, I think is when they started. Um, and um, uh, no, excuse me, 51 is when they started actually doing it. And then it continued through about 55 in, in, um, in Chicago. And then it reemerged in Hartford, Connecticut in the late 60s um, over at a UHF station there. And that's what this converter is from. 
Um, and I don't know anything, I have not read anything about the technology that was used. Obviously it was, I don't know if it was a phone line for the sink or, 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 or how it worked. Um, the, um, there's not very much data on it, but this, this uh, converter box was from, was from that era. Um, second one uh, what I talked about, want to talk about is the um, uh, uh, telemeter system. And telemeter started in, um, uh, was owned by Paramount Pictures, and they started um, in Palm Springs, California over a cable system. And, uh, and this was a coin system. You had to put coins in to activate it. Um, you put the money in and um, it, um, um, as soon as you put the, the proper amount you wanted in, then um, you tuned it to the television channel that was broadcasting it. And uh, again, the sync was transmitted separately over the cable system on a se separate frequency and the, rather than over a phone line and uh, then mixed back in. Um, Again, they had the same issue, it, and, and this was true of all of the pay, early pay systems. The revenue that came in didn't um, uh, didn't wasn't high enough to justify the cost of the technology. And the other problem that these these experiments had all the way through the '60s and '70s was that they were being fought by the by the uh, movie industry, uh, who were afraid that. Uh, pay TV was going to kill the movie industry. And it wasn't really until the advent of uh, pay-per-view and video on demand um, with modern technology uh, that um, films started being uh, um, made available, you know, on a in a timely way that made them, made them of interest to the public. Um, one little side note I should mention, Columbus was the site of, of one of the first large-scale tests of pay TV. It was done by a cable system that we own and involved about 6,000 customers. Um, we've transmitted um, movies on four channels. And uh, it was, uh, again, it was a technical success, but a financial failure. And about the same time, this is, this is in the CND, this is in the early 70s. And about the same time, HBO started being distributed by satellite. And for $6.95 a month, you could get a stream of movies compared to three or four dollars a piece for the movies. And that sort of killed it until you know, until later as technology caught up. And now today's world, of course, is all streaming and, and, and video on demand. So any questions about the um uh about these pay TV gadgets. I, I wonder uh, if it, the, the, the white one up there, a person apparently had to come by and collect the money every period of time. So yes. It, which, which makes it kind of doubtful it'd ever be profitable. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, well, I think, I'm not sure they thought that this particular technology was going to be profitable. Um, my guess is they thought, let's try the concept and see if the revenue stream is there. Then we'll figure out another way technically to do it. Okay. So this, it was a more of a revenue test than anything else, I think. Steve? Yeah. Uh, later on, uh, Zenith's experiments were. Uh involving uh, putting the audio on a 15.734 uh, uh, kilohertz uh, subcarrier wow. for their over-the-air pay TV. Uh, they did that in uh, Washington and Baltimore, maybe other cities. But uh, one of the big design flaws of the uh, later systems that Zenith had was on the converter boxes. They had the biggest wall warts that I have ever seen. I'm talking huge, like about yay wide, yay tall. They were completely potted and they were fraught with failures uh, to the point where it was the Achilles heel uh, of Super TV in the Washington and uh, Baltimore areas. Also the uh, Zenith system, the last uh, version used over the air, I saw a guy peddling uh, bootleg boxes at the Manassas Hamfest 
that were actually better designed than the Zenith boxes. They were dual channel. They had an RF amplifier and were much better designed. That's my 37 and a half cents worth, Steve. Uh, glad to get that additional information. Encoder for that last uh, Xena system John was talking about. Uh, I forget the name they called it, John, but anyway, Grass Valley Group built the encoder boxes uh, using one of their proc amps and they had a board in it that uh, inverted the video. Um, I'm, yeah, I periodically inverted the video and suppressed the sync or something like that, whatever they did. And that was a Grass Valley product. Yeah, it was called Savvy for Suppressed Sync Active Video Inversion. Right. It was much, much later than that. Uh, over the air box, you can't, there it was actually uh, intended for cable systems more than. Uh, over the air. Uh, in terms of, of the box you have there, uh, it required uh, a phone link to get the sync. I believe the later uh, version of the system did not require a constant phone link, but was based on uh, switching a delay line in and out of the video. So you would get strips, horizontal strips of video that were displaced left and right. And um, I don't know what the technology was for synchronizing the delay line switch in the decoder box. Uh, uh, that's about the extent of my knowledge. But uh, Savvy came quite a bit later. And also, the Zenith uh, Savvy system was very adaptable. Uh, at one of the cable systems I worked for, we were able to take the uh, Zenith parts list, not unlike one would a uh, the parts list out of an erector set, and create a very special box for, shall we say, a very special customer in which the boxes used the frequency inversion audio scrambling system uh, that was used by Zenith's uh, MMDS system, and but this time over cable. And uh, we were able to create a secure video, secure audio service for a very special customer. One of the problems in that SSAVI uh, system or whatever, I'm probably mispronouncing it, but there was an issue when you fed that into a TV transmitter and you inverted the video, whatever differential phase and gain correction you had on the transmitter was exactly opposite of what it should have been. So uh, you had either had to compromise for inverted video and non-inverted video, but one of the Grass Valley Group engineers came up with a board uh, option that went in that encoder that would have two sets of differential phase and gain corrections. So you could correct it for inverted video and non-inverted video through the TV transmitter. And Grass Valley didn't want to sell the board, so he just made them in his garage or something and sold them to the few customers that had those systems. But it was a, to fix a little minor problem so you didn't get color shifts when the Xena system flipped the... Uh, uh, phase back and forth, or the video polarity back and forth as it went through a TV transmitter. Yeah, there was also one other issue with the uh, savvy system later on, in that if uh, a broadcaster was uh, pounding their uh, video a little too hot above 100 IRE units, it would uh, trash the uh, sync, you know, the infamous video buzz that you would get over the air. And I won't mention the broadcaster, but let's just say there was a very famous commercial for Payless Shoe uh, Source that every time that ad aired on that station, all the customers would lose sync on uh, that commercial. Uh, unfortunately, one of the customers happened to be a commissioner of the FCC. Okay. Um... Let's um, move on to our presentation now. Uh, Mike Molnar is going to be talking to us about um, the Western um, Model 41. Um, 
So, Mike, we'll turn it over to you. All righty. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, hit share screen here. And uh, let's see if start the slideshow in the beginning. Can you tell me if you're getting the um, the presenter's view or are you getting the... Um... Just your camera, Mike. Not seeing anything yet. No, let's see. Uh, screen. There we go. And are you getting the presenter's view right now, I guess? Um, yeah, we're, we're seeing um, uh, the Zoom uh, website. Okay. How about there? Now we got you. Yep. You need to That's, go uh, full to screen on that. Okay. So let's see. That one? Perfect. Yep. Good. Okay. And the audio is good, I assume. Yes. Okay. So this is about the, uh, the Western or Echo Phone Model 41. I did find out um, that in at least one uh, letter, uh, soliciting stock uh, sales, Western uh, says they owned Echophone, which I would think should have been the other way around if you were promoting one to be the bigger company than the other. But um, we'll let that go. The, um, the purpose here is to say whether this was really the ultimate mechanical television for the home at the time, uh, talking in that 1932-33 range but it's also a um a television that may ne never have happened if it wasn't for three different people uh who happened to somehow come together and uh, we'll have a little quiz to start first uh, a confident and enthusiastic teenage inventor william randolph hearst and the maker of eskimo pies a piece of TV history that involved these three people. So we'll see how that happened was um, the inventor we're talking about is a very young Ulysses Sinabria, who um, in his high school days went to uh, impress his girlfriend and told her that uh, he was going to invent television. And he did, and was actually the third person after uh, Baird and Jenkins to display a, a working system. And that impressed William Randolph Hearst, who then went and invested money in uh, his work. And he went on to invent the uh, interlace system and had patents on early systems of that type. And the Eskimo Pie Man was, uh, let's see, it was um, Clem Wade. And he was making so much money in the age of refrigeration coming into people's homes, selling his Eskimo pies, that he took a, uh, a plunge on a, um, a new technology that maybe would, uh, would be a long shot and might bring him some, uh, another fortune. So he started the Western Company. I haven't found any great links between Western and Cenabria himself because he kept his own company going, working on large projection systems, but they must have licensed the um, interlacing system to, um, to use in the Western sets. And um, the 41 is, is the tabletop version of what, what is you've seen on other presentations from the Museum of the Empire State. The uh, Empire State set has the second receiver down the bottom for the audio portion of a program. But they both have uh, all these new features, a large screen for family viewing, if, if it was a family that would all sit and watch a, a movie on a cell phone, a brighter image, higher resolution, less flicker, holds a steady image, and uh, all built into a compact case. Here's the, uh, the large screen. And um, 
they did away with using the glow tubes that were popular at the time. The, uh, these would have a glowing neon plate. And the, the downside in those in the regular uh, disk systems, NIPCAL disk systems, was the entire light of the uh, tube wasn't used at any one time. The little dot you see here in this screen is the entire uh, brightness of the neon tube is only allowing one point to come through. And depending on the resolution, uh, it's been calculated out that you'd be seeing anywhere from only one two thousandth to one four thousandth of the light that's actually coming out of the tube. So you have a, a dim image uh, as a result of a very bright tube. So to get a brighter image in these sets, they used a new crater tube uh, that had come out. And they also uh, projected the light from that tube, which is a point source of light instead of a plate, through, uh, through a high resolution, which was 45 lines, scanning disk. And um, by triple interlacing, they, um, they had much less flicker. So we'll get into the detail of each of these. Steadier image with a, a new motor design uh, and uh, a very sensitive receiver using some of the new tubes that had come out at the time. And all of this was jammed into this uh, tabletop cabinet. The, um, if you didn't believe it was possible, well, you could have gone to the uh, Hudson Essex display, their television theater at the Century of Progress in Chicago in 1933, which is what this gentleman, John Jackman did on uh, October 25th. And he has proof that he was televised on the uh, Western system. So again, how did they do it? Um, when most of what was being used at the time by experimenters were these homemade sets uh, that uh, people would either buy the parts or a parts kit and use that, uh, that neon tube uh, behind the disc. And uh, uh, this is a, um, a Davin system that you could see all the holes for three different formats. Uh, and you would just move the tube to the, uh, to the right format that you were receiving. And they also were selling kits. This is a, a, a Jenkins, their, their low end version kit. You could buy the lenses separately. You could buy all the pieces uh, separately. And you would also need a, um, a Daven uh, or another resistance coupled amplifier to get the bandwidth. Uh, if you were hooking to a, um, a two uh, battery radio at the time with the last uh, stages going through audio transformers, you were limiting your bandwidth. So you would um, patch in and, uh, and use the resistance coupled amplifier to get a little better bandwidth. So again, some, uh, some more of how they did it. This is the set apart with all the components spread out. And the, um, the big projection screen that we were looking at is a ground glass screen. That's the rear view of it in the cabinet. And then that crater tube would be mounted on a bar behind the, uh, the lens disc. So to get that bright neon light, uh, it, they had discovered that um, you would get more ionization between very close tight elements than, than would you would with that broad plate. So they had this uh, construction with a heater to uh, bring in even more ionization. Um, the neon uh, ele uh, element, the connection is the, uh, the one on the front and, the, um, and then the common return for everything is on the, the back lead on the left. So the, the bright neon light is at the very dead center of, of these elements on the tube. Uh, I have an uh, arrow marking it. So that very tiny hole is the crater that makes it a crater tube. And that was mounted on an adjustable arm. You could bring uh, around to uh, set the height and distance to, to project through the lenses onto that rear projection screen. You could... Uh, had pretty good range to set it high or low, whichever way projected the best for you. And then this is the uh, the disc itself. So by the um, triple interlacing, you can see that's three different spirals uh, happening on the edges of the plate. 
and there's a lens in in each of these holes and it was press fit into place um and it must have been quite a manufacturing process because you would really have to uh keep each one pointing right to the screen if anything shifted a little bit would cause uh, a lot of distortion in the image so of the again we have the three sets of of 15 holes and the way the interlacing worked is uh, marked here for line one would be the first hole then the next then the next lens is actually line four and it wouldn't be you wouldn't see line two till you got to the next spiral and then uh, line three on the third one so every every space uh, advances goes to, uh, by by three lines and this uh, is a new motor design uh, they had that um, has a rotor and brushes on uh, contacts you can see at the center uh, rubbing against the the wheel there and that um, motor shaft that comes out of it is the way you would uh, frame the uh, uh, the picture so if if you were a little misplaced left or right you could uh, adjust the uh, the position of the motor by turning the knob at the back of the set the uh, the receiver uh, except for the big disc there would look a little like the um, co uh, cathedral radios that you'd see at the time except this had some uh, some higher end features their ads claim that it was uh, is a little conflicting. It's claiming to be a super heterodyne receiver and a three-stage TRF, which you kind of have to be one or the other, not uh, not both. But when I started looking at what's in the chassis, if you look at the uh, four-section tuning condenser, that'd be a lot more uh, compatible with a three-stage TRF circuit. I don't have an actual uh, diagram of the set. The tube complement was uh, some of the newer uh, pentodes that were available at the time. Uh, number 80 rectifier, uh, number 27 was commonly used as a detector and, a, and an audio amplifier. So there's uh, the complement goes down the list here. So you have uh, first, second, and third RF tubes, detector, first amplifier, second, and an output tube. And um, one thing that I, I was surprised to see at the bottom of the set was the an RCA uh, license tag. And um, and that starts to bring in some of the the way they were hooked up with the uh, echo phone to get a, an RCA uh, or a Hazeltine patent at the time was quite an investment for the quantity of uh, scanning disc televisions that were being It'd be what time a thousand dollars you produce staff. When I um, they would have made uh, getting close to uh, to ten thousand of these, and. Um, when I look at the actual tag that was on the back, it's number uh, 469. So I think most of the serial number uh, advancement was uh, echo phone radios and, um, and the tag on it was just to get the, uh, the license to make the Western televisions. But uh, part of what they would have used uh, Hazeltine patents for would have been the uh, shielding the tubes and the um, RF coils and making the RF coils smaller than what were in the old battery sets was something that um, I've seen published in some of the Hazeltine papers that they sent to, uh, to license holders. And uh, this little section is the resistance coupled amplifiers uh, circuit. So there were no audio transformers uh, in the system. So that, that got us to the, um, the complete chassis and um, and all, like I said, pretty compact, slides right into that tiny case. And the the idea being that uh, if you're going to convince the housewife that this is going to be added to the furniture, and they're used to seeing the little cathedral radios that were, were being built at the time, it's 
it's pretty acceptable and, and it's an ac operated uh chassis no batteries so one of the things that the larger screen did and um this is a little cheat of a picture that i i took on the empire state and kind of cut and pasted it onto here but um it's if you have the magnifier type screen that you would have on a regular disc set the uh it's very hard for more than one person to look into the porthole at one time at least with this if you're sitting close enough you could have two or maybe three people that uh, that are at least uh, friendly with each other that's another picture i captured so when it comes down to it what would have been the um the next development were they uh building any more of these uh did they come up with a bigger screen well no it all kind of fell apart when um the uh, end of the mechanical era came along and the uh this was on a one of the gernsback uh, magazines that crts were going to be taking over the uh, the business and uh and western met the uh, same demise as a, a lot of the people um this is the western visionette and um i wanted to be able to show what some of the pictures like this would look like and um, so i did my little setup i have a little monitor to show the picture that i was going to put in uh and the steps i took was first a picture on my phone uh download to my pc put it on a thumb drive thumb drive to the video converter uh video converters ntsc to what i call my daryl verter and uh 45 line triple interlace to the western visionette and then another picture on my phone and that's it uh, actually running um depending on where you stand you get seem to get a little more magnification and uh that's a picture i i took on my phone of uh myself and my grandson and um I'm also working on a, an article that's going to be published uh, in the AWA review on uh, a lot of mechanical systems and a, a bit of a history on it. And uh, at the end, there's always a picture of the author. And I think uh, Tim Martin was working, uh, was watching tonight. So I'm going to give him a little advance uh, uh, picture of the author's page. Um, so this is a picture of me and my, my helper, Lila and uh and then captured on the uh on the western uh, visionette in uh 45 line triple interlaced uh magic system recording in progress so that's the end um i hope it gave a little better idea of what mechanical television was like and i'll turn it back to you guys and uh, I, I have a question. Sure. Um, the uh, pictures you showed at the end are wider at the bottom than the top. And yeah, I had to flip it. It's it, it, the original was just the opposite, so uh, it's, it's okay. keystoning. I was wondering if the uh, if the uh, projector sets uh, uh inverted the picture right? yeah some, something happened in in my converting uh everything maybe if, if daryl's watching you could tell me what i did wrong yeah i'm not sure i saw it was backwards but it, the, the, whether it's projection or the scan disk it should be the same obviously were they, back then they would have been fed from the same signal yeah um but anyway, I, I cheated and uh, I had the wrong group to cheat against, so I got caught. I have a probably a dumb question, but did this actually show video, any movement, or were they only still oh, yeah, pictures? No. no, it was movement. Um, and actually the picture is better with movement because in the, um, I think this was uh, 15 frames, I'm not sure. Um, but in, in that time, you're seeing more detail in, in each little, uh, flash so your eye puts it together a little better than it does on a still image and that's where the was it for you said 45 frames per second uh no i think it's uh 15 but uh daryl might know better than yeah. yes it's 15 15 what so was there the, 
I'm sorry. Go ahead. What was the RF frequency of the receiver? They were uh, probably 20. Uh, 20K on this uh, was the, the bandwidth. Uh, when they went on to the lower short wave, they went somewhere 10, and then they went to 20 um, for, I, I think, this time period. And then they started to think of going up into 100K, but uh, I don't think that, that ever, well, ever not, happened. Not I'm, so, I'm sorry, not not the bandwidth, but what actual RF frequency was the transmitter on? Oh, the, um, the frequency well, was the it was what they called short wave then, I guess, but just a little bit above the AM broadcast band. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mike, can you stop the uh, share screen? Uh, yeah, I'm trying to find a screen at all. Mm. Let's see. Oh, you're on your browser. You got to go back to the uh, Zoom screen. Okay. And it's just saying me that I'm. They want me to upgrade. <laughs> uh, let's see if I can get rid of that. You can't do it from there, huh? Uh, I might. Uh, hang on. I move you your mouse to tap center. And and see if you get a pop-up. Yeah. yeah, regarding frequency, I'll mention one of the broadcasters at the time was University of Iowa Educational Television was two to 2.1 megahertz. So actually upper end of the MF range. Yeah, yeah the... There was a whole uh, burst of activity in the Midwest, uh, and it, and Western was one of the uh, uh, suppliers for a lot of it. But there's University of Iowa. There, I saw something about some broadcasts from uh, University of Illinois in Urbana, and then a couple of uh, the Chicago stations. So there was a little uh, and Kansas City. Uh, so there was a burst of activity in the in the Midwest, and there was one. I think it's on the uh, uh, early television website, a story about from an engineer who uh, worked for him at the time, and uh, and he was picking up the signal and thought he was picking up Chicago, but when he couldn't get it to sync, he finally figured, found out that the Chicago one was off the air, and he was picking up Kansas City, which was on a different power system, so he couldn't sync it in. So uh, it, it, there were a lot of people using the same uh, fifteen. Uh, uh, the 45 interlaced uh, system. I don't have any record of how many they actually would have sold. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has any detail on that. No, I've never seen any figures. Um, you, the, you, you mentioned something there that the, th this um, receiver uses um, a synchronous motor. And um, that was great if you lived in the same power system but none of the power systems were tied together at that time. So unless you lived in Chicago or nearby, you could not get um, you know, a picture to sync from the, from, from, from the uh, Sanabria, you know, the 45 line system. Yeah. Hey, Mike, a, a couple of questions came to mind while you were doing the presentation, things I hadn't uh, thought about before. Um, do you know what the improvement in the bandwidth was going to a uh, Daven resistance coupled amplifier? You know, what it was, it, the traditional versus their super duper RC amplifier? Uh, I don't have any specs on it, but the, uh, the reason was the, to get the audio transformers, you know, interstage uh, transformers out of the uh, circuit because they're mm -hmm. The uh, audio bandwidth on uh, on early AM radios, uh, tube sets and all is is really low to begin with. So um, if you got those out, that that was the whole purpose for going to resistance coupled. Was the bandwidth of the signal greater than the uh, the standard broadcast band, ten kilohertz? Spacing, yeah, they, they tried to. With it, with it, the first steps were to use the regular AM band, but just stretch the uh, the bandwidth as much as they could within that limit and then when they went to that little bit into the short wave they uh, at least they started to double the bandwidth over the uh, am broadcast 
1932 and 1933, the Depression was just starting to get cranked up. Any idea what these things cost back then? And was it for rich people or could the average experimenter ham afford one? Uh, the, some of the ads showed, um, certainly as time went by, uh, discounts of like 50%. But uh, you could have bought the Hollis Baird one, I think, for $89. Uh, I think the... Um, the ad I saw for one of the westerns was around the same. A whole week's pay. Oh yeah. And then, um, uh, and, and then the whole thing that killed it. I mean, think people would have bought them at that, but there was no real entertainment value. You're not going to. Uh, I have a picture that'll be in the uh, in the other article, showing a guy who went through all his work to build his whole system up, and he's got this huge box with a three inch hole on the top. And he's trying to sit in his easy chair and he's got a hand button to press to try to keep it in sync. And uh, so it was a lot of work to to not find anything you're going to enjoy uh, after as a reward of all your work, except to say I did it. And, um, you know, there's certainly enough examples of that. Someone had to buy the first uh, VCRs. Someone had to buy the uh, the first uh, digital phone uh, uh, wristwatches and all that stuff. So they're always a few, but in the end, it was never going to be enough to uh, to support. And when when I was researching the article I'm working on, uh, I found a lot out about the um, the 1932 um, field test that RCA did, and published in the uh, proceedings of the IRE. There's a whole detailed report uh, that they really did the first examination of how many lines of resolution you would need, what screen size how far away you could sit from a screen, and then how many people could enjoy what, what they're watching. And they could actually draw curves as you, if you wanted to increase the number of people, you had to increase the, the, the lines per inch, not even overall resolution, but lines per inch. And, uh, and from what I could see, that's the first real study of what would, would stop it from being a toy to being something that had uh, home entertainment value. They, uh, the that uh, field test was uh, 120 lines, uh, mechanical camera, and then uh, 120 lines on the, uh, on the uh, CRT receiver. And just before that, um, I, ha I have a, um, there's a book called The Box, and this guy had interviews in it from different people in the um, early days of television. And he interviewed a guy that was the um, uh, RCA's engineer for their mechanical a TV station in New York before they, they went electronic. And he did a, he told a story about doing this really big um, display uh, in a theater, set up their best equipment. Sarnoff was there. All the big shots came there. And he was watching them uh, view this last uh, big mechanical display that they built. And he told the story of watching their eyes. And, and as, as they all left, they carefully took all the equipment apart, took it outside the theater and, and left it in the trash because they, they just saw that, that the decision then was, this is never going to have entertainment value. So that, who, who was that, Mike? Uh, I can get his name. I'll, I'll, uh, I, I go blank on that stuff. Oh, yeah, I do too. Just curious. Yeah. But no, he, he was um, uh, the engineer for their W2 xbs was it i forget their call but um yeah he he's captured in this book of uh, a whole lot of uh famous people from and that's the, about the earliest and then it keeps going on uh into into commercial television so another, so another thing that i saw in there mike was the um when you showed the disc with the triple interlace Mm -hmm. um, line two started uh, a third of the way around the disc uh, after line one, it looks like, had, had finished. Um, so no, actually, line one and all the other ones in that part of the spiral finish before you get to line two. So you're, right. you're, what's blending into your eye is going uh, line one, line four, line you know, seven down. And then you, so you're seeing a really Venetian blind until you get to all three spirals in the one revolution. But, but what I had never thought about before is that 
there's no um, persistence of a phosphor there. So this system was depending entirely on the persistence of vision of your eye, right? Absolutely, yep. To merge those three yep. images. Yep. And and did that did they calculate that out or did they get lucky and how well, well did they, that work? I, I think the, the bare minimum uh, in some of the earlier experiments, I think they talked about 10, but um, typically in the, in the mechanical stuff, 15 was already pretty low, but if you're flashing that, that 15 line uh, segment uh, three times in a revolution, then, then your eye starts to put it together better. <clears throat> then they, one of the um, other developments around that same time was a, um, uh, they came out with 60 lines, but with no interlacing. So that was straight, straight through Jenkins uh, made one of those. And um, they had, uh, that was right at the end before they closed up. Yeah, there uh, were uh, experiments uh, on interlacing uh, that, uh, you know, determined that the eye was uh, more sensitive to wide area flicker than to narrow line back and forth flicker. But uh, the mechanical systems we're still really struggling not to uh, look uh, terrible. They, they could just barely get to acceptable. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, and it's amazing. Um, one of the uh, big experimenters was Alex Anderson from uh, General Electric. And um, he started to realize that was happening. And, and in one interview, uh, he said with the technology that was going to be available, if, if what people wanted from television was a system where, you know, if it was like a, on a, a two-way telephone thing that you wanted to say, yeah, I recognize my friend and I can see that he's moving, then television with what he had to work with would be okay. But if you wanted it for entertainment value, he said he had, he had basically given up. He, he turn things over to the electronic people at RCA. And Mike, is there a yeah, schematic for the yeah, Davin amplifier somewhere? Uh, the uh, reason I ask is that it, it occurs to me that the um, RC couple amplifier is going to have better phase response as well as bandwidth than uh, a transformer output. Uh, and that might be important, especially for the low frequencies. Okay, I didn't think of that, yeah. No, I, I don't have a diagram, of, uh, but I haven't really looked for one either. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mike, this is Steve. Um, yeah. Very interesting presentation. Uh, oh, thanks. Um, does anybody else have any more questions on the presentation? Um, otherwise, I mean, feel free to chime in anytime with them. Um, but um, let's open this up to anybody that wants to talk about anything. Well, I hate to, uh, to say this, but uh, when you switch to Monday, it ended up on my wedding anniversary. So I'm going to go down and visit with my wife for a little while. So I'm going to be that, dropping out right now. I think that's a good idea. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, I want to be able to go to the convention, you know, so I have to be nice. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Tell guys. Pam, thank you for sharing you. Will do. <laughs> bye bye. Thanks, Mike. Bye. Bye bye. Steve and Dave, this is Dave Arland, and I just wanted to thank Larry for having the museum open this weekend. I had a chance to stop by for a few minutes. I was in Columbus and Hilliard, 
And I just wanted to assure everybody that the museum is still there and uh, it's looking a little bit lonely, but Larry's had lots of visitors uh, in a mask and uh, just wanted to let people know it's still there. And I know we can't all be there tonight, but uh, it's going to be exciting to have a convention again. Has he dusted? Uh, <laughs> yes, it was clean. It was good. <laughs> One of the things that we're doing prior to the convention, I don't know, Dave, if you went back out into the warehouse, but it's in um, uh, need of a thorough reorganization. And one of the things we're planning on doing is asking people to volunteer a couple of weeks before the convention and come over and just sort of clean the whole place out, get rid of stuff that we never have a use for, um, clean it out and make it a little bit more presentable. Hey, Steve, yeah. uh, what, along that line, there may still be some reels of uh, one inch wide videotape back in that area. If there still is, there's an outfit called Obsolete Video Services in Los Angeles that would love to get their hands on it. Okay, why don't you, uh, we have no use for it. Can you send, can you send me an email or a text or something with a, Contact information, and I will get I'll see forward to that. Sure, I'll do so. Thank you. Did I hear no masks in Ohio? Like California, we don't have masks anymore. Uh, so I think it's your mileage may vary. Uh, Larry works in a, in a healthcare environment normally, so I'm sure he's being very careful. And uh, he did ask that people wear a mask for people who come in. So I think we'll know a little bit more when we get to the convention. Right. Certainly the numbers are dropping everywhere, which is great. Right, as of now, we require masks to come in. Um, okay. As Dave says, I have no idea what the situation is gonna be at convention time. Yeah, no, California is now, in most counties has dropped the mask requirement. It's going to end with a whimper, not a bang. Well, we're in the end of a two-year cycle, which seems to be typical of these kinds of things. And uh, at least that's what the uh, scientific uh, analysis that I've read said. That two years, well, they peak, and then they go down. Based on exactly no specific data at all, I uh, everybody was saying, oh, it's going to be over in four weeks, or oh, it's going to be over in April, back in the beginning. And... I went back and read up on the 1918 thing, and I said, no, it looks a little bit more like two years to me. And I'm the dumb guy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to the convention with appropriate precautions. Me too. <laughs> Steve, there's a Hartman scanner on eBay now. It was uh, going uh, mechanical TV scanner. It was going for four ninety five last week, but then it, uh, no one bid on it, and it's nine ninety five this week starting bid. But, <laughs> but he, he said he's taking offers, so I don't know if he got one in the museum or not. I don't know. I wasn't aware of it. I will uh, take a look at it. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's not calling it a Hartman. He has the name, the name of the uh, manufacturer of the of the metals on the on the disc and also on the uh, platform. It's a you, you, oh, have a, you have a write up on the Hartman on your on your site and it talks about the manufacturer and stuff. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll look at it. Remember, he, he's only asking four ninety five last week, and he couldn't sell it for that. He couldn't sell it for that zero bids. <laughs> so we'll wait till next week it'll be even more yeah that's right well are we out of steam it's unusual i'll say something i saw something on craigslist and it was a video disc player do you have anything like that? 
products. <clears throat> we have a number of video disc players. Um, I can't remember specifically what, but we've had several donated. You're thinking like a laser vision player? Yeah. Well, no, we, should, we have the, um, the um, uh, I can't remember the acronym now, but the, uh, the film-based uh, player that was donated. And um, we should probably have some CED, pl a CED player and a, uh, and a laser player at some point, too. You're thinking of the EVR player, uh, Dave. EVR, that's right. Yeah. That's all um, newer stuff, but uh, we, we should probably be, uh, uh, you know, have a, have a sampling of that for some of the displays. <laughs> I'll say something else. The uh, something I heard ages ago, and it was when uh, television was first uh, conceived. And they said, "What are we going to do with it?" And they said, "Well, what we could do with it is we'll put one on each bank, and if you're uh, you come in and want to cash a check, we'll be able to communicate uh, and show your picture back someplace else where they know you, and say, yeah, that's him. He's okay. You can cash his check." So it might, might have sufficed for that, but like I say, there isn't much, the, 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 the quality of it wasn't enough to, uh, yeah. I, I never well, you know. That's, that's interesting. I, I hadn't heard that story, but you know, I just uh, applied for an Amazon credit card the other day. And I, I guess I should have seen this coming, but I, I was really stunned. In order to get approved for the credit card, I had to hold up my phone and move it back and forth and take a video of my face and, and send that over to them. So that was a, that was a George Orwell moment for me. Okay, wow. You know, the, rather than use your face, and I know this is kind of stretching what we're talking about here, but your face has a lot of muscles. And if you see any good actor, they can really make themselves look like something else just with their face. Well, I would say you take your hand, okay, and look at the back of your hand, you don't need the fingerprints, and just the relationship of the length of your different fingers, let alone all the detail. I think something like the back of your hand could be a better thing to use than your face. <laughs> or you, just as long as you're not wearing a glove, you know. Well, the face facial recognition uh, works uh, surprisingly well, except when it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, there. Uh... Our uh, biometric hand scanners that have been used for security, that's uh, uh, a fairly old idea now. And uh, mm. I, uh, I don't have any idea how reliable they are, but uh, probably used in conjunction with a uh, magnetic card or something like that hmm. i'm stunned wayne how well those little fingerprint sensors on the phones work it's amazing yeah i uh, living in southern arizona i found that in winter my fingertips get so dry that my phone no longer recognizes my fingerprint <laughs> and in summer it works again Well, it's nice living in the future. <clears throat> when are they going to introduce smell to television? Some of the programs already smell. 